church, the world church was dealing with. And the issue is, how are we saved? That's what we're saying here. That's what Paul is writing the letter about. How are we saved? And after the meeting, all the meetings were concluded and the discussions were concluded, the question was asked, how are we justified? And one option was, by faith, 100% of the hands went up. Now, the problem, how are we sanctified? By faith, 25% of the hands went up. How are we sanctified? By faith and works, 75% of the hands went up. That's a matter of record, okay? You can look it up in the uh, Review and Herald of August 1976, but you have to look it up yourself because they don't print it to be read on the internet, okay? That's an absolute fact. So, there is no contribution on our part to our salvation. What does Romans 8, 8 say? I'll paraphrase it for you. Those who depend on the contributions of the flesh cannot please God. Who would like to volunteer to read 1 Corinthians 15, 50? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Volunteer? Over here, Diane. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit any corruption. There is no contribution in our part. There's only one line of descendants from Abraham. That's the spiritual descendants. Those that access the faith of Jesus. How do we become sons and daughters of God? But yes, by receiving the free gift of salvation through Christ. If the offspring is singular, does that limit the promises to singular? No. No. We just read it last week. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. We read seven blessings that become a reality if we believe as Abram believed at that time. So, since perfect and everlasting righteousness was guaranteed and the promise was made to Abraham and established by Christ, by the oath of God, would it be possible for the law spoken 430 years ago to be changed or the promise made void? Is that possible? So it doesn't matter what you hear preached if it's not consistent with what God promised Abram, it's what? It's a perversion. If nothing can be taken away from the promise, can anything different be required of us that was required of Abram? No. No. So why then the law? Why is Paul introducing the law here when we've been talking about faith? Why is introducing the law in verse 19? Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was. What did we learn about the word transgressions? What does it mean? It's the worst kind of usage of the word. Huh? Knowingly, willingly, and deliberately sin. That's as bad as it gets. It's important for us to remember, never forget, that the law of God existed before Mount Sinai. It won't hurt to review this. Let's read it. I need a volunteer to look up Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16. We're going to read several verses. Very, very important that we be constantly reminded of this. Exodus chapter 16. When you get there, say ready, and I'll give you the verse. Who wants to read it? Over here, Patty. Verses 1 through 4 first. Exodus 16, verses 1 through 4. And a journey from him and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elm and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Then the whole congregation of 
administration and the Children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the Children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. For we sat by the Lord's meat, and we did go to fulfill. For you have brought us out into the wilderness, into the wilderness wilderness, to kill this whole that we can cover. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will bring bread from heaven before you, and the people shall go out and gather the simple bread each day, that I may test them whether they walk, will walk with my God or not. With my what? My law. Now that's just a little peek. Now, who would like to read verses 26, 27, and 28 of the same chapter? Genesis, Exodus 16. Volunteer. Okay, Mary Jane. Exodus 16, verses 26, 27, and 28. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Now it happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Thank you. What does that tell us? The law of God was in place before what? Sinai. Where we generally associate the law of God being what? Given. So it was necessary to show them in the most dramatic way that their unbelief was what? Sin. Yes, sin. They're murmuring against God in the way that God had been leading them since He brought them out of Egypt, showed their ignorance of what? God's righteousness. And the fact that they thought that they could establish their own righteousness. Paul says that in Romans 10, verse 3. So unless they saw their sin, it would be impossible for them to real to experience what the promise. Therefore, it was necessary for the law to be what spoken. Who spoke the law at Sinai? Yes. Who was the mediator? Let's read it. 1 Timothy 2.5. Volunteer for 1 Timothy 2.5. Volunteer. 1 Timothy 2.5. Okay, Mary Jane. And a, and a volunteer for Colossians chapter 1. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Yep. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16, 17, and 18. Now the left, please. For by him all things were created, the Lord in heaven, and that the on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and in all things he may have the preeminence. Thank you. So Jesus is what? The mediator. Mm -hmm. And it's through him that the promise was made. If the law were against the promises of God, wouldn't it follow that God was against himself? So what is the answer for verse 19? Wherefore then serveth the law? The shelves. The law. It's a mirror. Without the law, we would not sin. All correct answers. I'm going to say something that you may not have heard before. Hope it doesn't upset you. But writing the law on tables of stone was not God's first choice. The people of Israel had been uh, slaves for 400 years in Egypt. They had forgotten. Yes. Think about slavery today and, and the years gone by. When, when, 
people were enslaved, and we have people enslaved all over the world, the things that they normally did were taken away from them because the only way you can enslave someone is to take away their freedoms. The Egyptians took away the freedoms. They took away from them the ability to, to have their, their Sabbaths, you know, and so forth. And so when God brought these people out of Egypt, he had essentially babies who had no knowledge, very little knowledge, if, it, if any. There were a few, yes, Aaron and Miriam, those who were leading, but they still had little knowledge of the law. And he had to take the opportunity to reprint that law on their hearts. And that's where he wanted the law, but he had to start with tables of stone so that they could see it. They had to understand it because it was there in front of their face. <clears throat> the object lesson here is that Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah addresses this issue in Jeremiah 31 verses 31 and 34 and the Apostle Paul quotes this situation in Hebrews 8. I invite you to turn to Hebrews 8 and see how God reacted to their unbelief after taking two years, one month, and one day to bring them from Egypt to Mount Sinai, showing them daily, and to provide them food, protecting them in the daytime with clouds over them because of the hot desert sun protecting them from the cold of the desert, with fire over them, constantly demonstrating to them that he was in charge and that he wanted for them to listen attentively to everything that he was saying to them. Okay, Hebrews 8, beginning with verse 6. I'm going to read this because I need to make comments. Everybody ready? But now, God has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on what? Yes. See, in Exodus 19, verse 5, God says, I brought you out of Egypt. I watched over you like an eagle watches over the baby eagles as they start flying. And when they're ready to crash, the mama eagle comes in and whoosh, catches them. So, eagle. I've seen it in the mountains of California. It's quite a sight. Then he says, all I'm asking you to do is to cherish, guard, protect, keep, and listen attentively. That's what the word obey means. And if you do, I will make you a kingdom of what? Priest. What did the people say in verse 8? No problem. Everything you say, we will accomplish it. That was the problem. It was God's intent, after giving them all of those evidences for two years, one month, and one day, that they could trust Him. Yes, they had been slaves for 430 years, but now they have seen the hand of God day. Morning. Evening, and they said they didn't get it. Hebrews 8, verse 7. If that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. Now, what is the problem with the first one? Verse 8. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day in which I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And I did not care for them, says the Lord. Now, here's the key verse. Amen. By the way, Paul is quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put 
my laws into their minds, and I will write them upon their hearts. So it's been God's will to write His laws where? In the heart. In the heart. And all that God requires of us, He gives to us. Everything that God requires of us, He gives to us. Why? Because we, He knows that we're what? Helpless. We don't have the power to do anything. When God's law says, Thou shalt not, that's God's way of assuring us that if we access the faith of Jesus, Jesus will what? Preserve us from the sin against which He, God, is warning us. Who would like to read Ephesians 1.13? Ephesians 1.13. Volunteer for Ephesians 1.13. Diana. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Thank you. What did we learn the word seal mean? Seal for what? Security and preservation. Paul uses the same word in Ephesians 4.30. When we recognize that the law of God is a reflection of His character and also a mirror for me to see what I look like in comparison to God and that it's God's will to reproduce His character in me, we will then appreciate what David wrote. This is beautiful. In Psalms 119. Who would like to look up Psalms 119? The longest Psalms in the book. Psalms 119, verses 113 and 114. Psalms 119, 113 and 114. Who would like to read that for us? Volunteer? Linda? Yes, of Psalms 119. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I don't think, is that correct? No. no. Okay. Okay, okay. I apologize. Please. I hate the dumb minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. You like that? My hope is in what? What is his word? His promises to us. Galatians 3.23. I have to do some skipping and going over some things because I'm running out of time again. Galatians 3.23. Who would like to read Galatians 3.23 for us? In order to understand Galatians 3.23, we have to add the word. It's a three-letter word. It's the definite article T-H-E-V. And it goes between the words before and faith. Maybe I should read it to you. Galatians 3, 23. I'm going to read it to you the way that it was originally recorded. In the Greek language. Everybody there? But before the faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. In the secular world, when someone breaks the law, what do we do to them? Put them in jail. They go into custody. When God's law is broken, what happens? Since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, what happens to us when we sin? We go under custody. We're under confinement. What's the biblical solution? What's the biblical solution? Who would like to read Isaiah 42, 6 and 7? Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. 
by the way, Romans 6 says, for wages of sin is death. It's not custody. It's death. Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. Who would like to read that for us? It says, I, the Lord, have called thee. Isn't that beautiful? I will hold your hand. So everything in verse 7? To open the blind eyes, to bring up prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of prison. Thank you. Someday, if not already, the Holy Spirit is going to convict you of sin. <laughs> and when it does, you will feel like you're in custody. You will feel like you're in a prison with the prison walls. In fact, I don't know if you've ever been swimming and something happened and you were submerged in the water and you felt like you were about to drown. It's a, it's a suffocating feeling. At that point in time, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance the promise of the faith of Jesus. <clears throat> that if you and I accept that, the moment that we accept it, the prison doors fly open and you are free. Time doesn't permit us, but you can make a note of that. Psalms 124, verses 7 and 8. Okay. Galatians 3.24. Who would like to read that for us? Galatians 3.24. Therefore the law is our school master to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by Jesus. Thank you. So, some versions use the word... I want to say, it's, you said... Um, that, um, I'm trying to paraphrase this, I don't remember exactly what I said. But what you just mentioned about um, prison war with with sin, when you when the, when you sin and the Holy Spirit speak to your heart, even when you sin and the Holy Spirit convict you, I think it's more than even prison war because guilt is heavy like a lead. And it weighs you down. It's the biggest burden to walk around with guilt, knowing that you have sinned. It's, it's a heavy burden. It, to me, it's even worse than prison walk. But when you confess and God has forgiven you, you are like, you're so light. You're so burden free. And if anyone have experience, which I assume I'm not the only one, if, to be free from the burden of sin. <laughs> it's a great freedom because sin is very, it's worse than prison. Amen. <laughs> So I just wanted to emphasize that. Yes. The difference for me was that when I sinned and I was truly repentant and asked for forgiveness, my focus was on, okay, I still have a chance to make it to heaven. But then I graduated to the gospel aspect of sin, recorded in Hebrews 6, 4, 5, and 6. And I recognized that when I sinned, I was re-crucifying Christ. Completely different concept that I wonder if I'm going to make it to heaven since I messed up. Completely different concept. Because it took it away from you and went to Christ. So my motivation now to live the Christian life is, am I worried about my salvation? See, that's what the book of Galatians is about. How am I saved? How are we saved? We're focused on ourselves. Once we understand that we have been saved, now the question is, how does Jesus want for me to relate to him? Because I'm still here on planet Earth. <coughs> and when you get to that point and you sin, then you're burdened because you have heard Jesus. Not so much about where you are in your salvation. Because you love him so much that you don't want to hurt Jesus. That's it. That's it. Some of the Galatian converts did something very interesting. They tried to make friends with the law. Are there Christians today that try to make friends with the law? And what does the law say to us when we try to make friends with the law? What does it mean to make friends with the law? Let me focus on being good. What happens when I make friends with the law? What does the law say? Hey! That's not my job to save you. 
My job is to put this mirror, these Ten Commandments in front of you so that you can see the character of God. And hopefully see yourself and what you look like and recognize that God is trying to reproduce His character in you. What else does the law say? You need to go to someone else that can help you. I cannot help you. Does Scripture deal with that? Everyone is invited to turn to Romans 5, 20 and 21. Everyone invited to turn. I've got to say something. Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. So the law is our friend. Because the law is faithful in showing us our great need for Christ. So praise God for the law. He's our friend. It is. We should be afraid of it. We should, be, we should rejoice in the law. Romans 5, 20 and 21. Who would like to read that for us? Mary Jane. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Amen. But when sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So as sin reigneth in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. There it is again. Through whom? Everything is through Him. Because He's the one through whom everything happened. He's the one that redeemed us. So don't try to make friends with the law. Appreciate the law like this brother shared with us. Because it's God's what? Solution. And it's right in front of us every day. The law. So we can look at ourselves. Look at God. And make the choice. Who do I want to look like today? I don't know why I wrote this in 1888. Uh, 1886 actually. And the, uh, it's in the 1888 materials. Page 166. And uh, she's talking about the latter rain. And the righteousness of Christ. The third of the message. And she's quoting an angel. He says, said my God, quote, there is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. Both. Can't just present one, and, you know, just the law by itself or the, or the gospel by itself. They have to be both presented. And the angel still, still talking. This message understood in its true character and proclaimed in the spirit will lighten the earth with its glory. So we need to hear both, always. Amen. So outside of Christ, what do we have? Bondage. We're in sin. In prison. Only in Christ is there freedom. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to do the reading. Galatians 3.25 But now that the faith has come, we're no longer under what? A tutor. Do you like that solution? It's our choice. 26. For you are all sons of God, verse 26, through the faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. What's the significance of verse 29? The converted Jews to Christianity, teachers, were going to Galatia and saying to the people, if you want to be saved, you need to be circumcised. That's the problem. Whenever you think of doing anything and the thought occurs to you, ah, oh, maybe a star in that crown. Maybe God's special favor. Maybe He'll answer that prayer that I've been asking Him to answer for a long time. Those thoughts are old covenant thoughts. And what Paul is saying here in verse 29 to these Galatians is that I don't care what your genetics are, what your genetic line is. If you do not belong to Christ, forget about your genetics being Abraham's seed. Do we understand that? 